Karen Good joins us. Karen is a Texas-based psychotherapist, author, and leader in parent coaching, among other things. She joins us this evening to explore her recent Red Wheel Wiser 2010 release, Kids Who See Ghosts, How to Guide Them Through Fear. Now, I think because of 21st Century Radio and the Zoe Show, we've talked about ghosts and seeing ghosts for many decades now. Many of us remember our own children or our grandchildren or maybe even our own experience of talking to invisible playmates or seeing Grandpa Fred or Grandma Ethel. You know, parents, our guest makes clear, do have a challenge for sure. And here to talk about what she's found over the years in working with both children and their families is that there are ways to direct a child's experience by having the right kind of conversations and framework with them. So just want to say that anything, obviously, that's good for children who see ghosts is also useful to the unexpected adult who encounters these interdimensional phenomena and who want to understand what is taking place or how to better use an innate or developing skill. And to help us do that is Karen Good. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. Oh, it's great to be here this evening. Thank you. Well, your book is delightful, and it's obvious from the many different things at your Academy for Coaching Parents dot com that I've looked at. You've been involved with families for a long time, but how specifically did you get involved with children who see ghosts? Well, I had my own imaginary playmates, as you might guess, and this specific book came about because I did a blog post on the new show about psychic kids who see ghosts on the A&E channel. I've seen that. And I happened to have those uh, magic words. And I got thousands and thousands of emails Mm -hmm. from parents, not so much to share that their children saw ghosts, but what to do when their two-year-old talks about a dead relative or what to do when their child wakes up in the middle of the night and there's somebody in the room. So some of these incidents that parents spoke about, you know, were very real to the child, and others, of course, were fear-based experiences like night terrors. So I had so many of these, and I, I researched and found, though, that there, there wasn't a book really on the topic. You know, let's, so to me it was like, let's have this conversation, let's talk about it, and just step out a little bit and help the parents who need this book. So I wrote it. It's a, it's an, And it's a wonderful guide. And again, if you're just joining us, Karen Good's book, Kids Who See Ghosts, How to Guide Them Through Fear, A Wiser 2010. Now, there are all different kinds of ways children access these dimensions, whether it's a playmate or a deceased relative. So let's talk about the differences in general. Can you sort out the categories for us of of the experiences children have? I think the experiences that children have are mostly categorized by age. But let's understand that young children have imaginary friends and young children have enough neural power, enough brain power, and their brain waves fluctuate so much in and out that they often see uh, into, I think, a very real imaginatory imagination, a very real imaginal world is what we call it. So young children have their experiences, but let's say they grow up And kids can have varied kind of experiences. Let's just call it the basic intuition, because everybody's had some sort of intuitive experience. Sometimes it's associated with a lost loved one, or a high school student may have lost a friend in college. And that sets in motion a stress pattern that the human mind is trying to help explain to the person with, with a lot of stress you know, that they might see, they might dream, they might get chills when thinking about them. So there's a lot of phenomena like that that go along with the grieving process or the loss of someone. But uh, children who have had early trauma or children who are extremely sensitive to foods, environment, like gluten sensitivity or uh, high-impact noise environment, you know, they too become overly stressed. So when those adrenals pump cortisol to the temporal lobes and start activating 
uh, images. Children, again, have dissociation, and they may go to the place where they feel safe or where they tune it out and tune into other worlds. In this book, you know, we talk about children who are often labeled ADHD, and there are some pieces of research that have examined some of their brainwave states. And, you know, they go into dreaming states quite often, uh, just just like listening to music in their head or just like uh, seeing spirits on the other side. Well, you know, and obviously there are because children the... who believe it's part of their life, it's perfectly normal, it's been with them for a long time, and that, in a sense, is their reality. So I think you've got it caused by stress. I think you've got some trauma dissociation. And none of these things are negative. It's all just part of what we do with our life. And what we're looking at is how do people respond to those incidents? And for the children who this is a real intuitive gift, then how do we respond to them? You said so many different things that I want to um, address a few of them because you talked about Michael Mendeza's and discussion of electromagnetic spectrum, and you mentioned that in terms of the effect of stress or the effect of trauma. Or, But there are other children who have neither stress nor trauma, and they just have these developed sensibilities. And I think we've done n- numerous shows on this kind of new paradigm arena in which we see a shift in consciousness from children through adults. And so we see it across the spectrum of age. But you you also point out that oftentimes people want to dismiss what children tell them as simply being, quote unquote, imaginary, as if the imaginal realm isn't substantive. And so I think one of the important things, things I liked in your book was you share several stories of children's experiences to show why the experience is not something they could have made up. Because always there's, you know, this effort to dismiss either your own child or somebody else's child or as a teacher having to deal with it. I mean, there are many times adults come into association with children who talk about their imaginary playmate or a deceased relative. So let's talk about how you sort out reality in in the deepest sense of the word from, you know, maybe it is just fear or maybe it is hallucination or maybe it is only, you know, made up, so to speak. And a child who's three or four has had ghost experiences or continued visits. There was a time in the work of Joseph Chilton Pierce and Michael Mendeza when it was thought that these children would shut down these imaginary gifts when the brain was pruned at age six or seven. Mm -hmm. But now, as you mentioned, in this new realm of consciousness, we're seeing it more and more. Children... Uh, at 7, 8, 9, and 10, still have experiences, and 18 and 19-year-olds. Uh, for them, this is normal. So how do we discern it? For the children who see spirits, who interact with them on a daily basis as it's part of their life, uh, we look for the consistency of their report, and we look for their relationship with ghost. I often have parents who say to me, I'm not sure it's true, and sometimes My response is, it doesn't matter whether or not you believe it's true. I want you to believe in your kid. And if something is going on internally, subjectively, don't you want to know as a parent? So in the book, there was a story of a young girl, Lucy, who happened to wake up and see a ghost in her father's apartment. Her parents were recently divorced. She goes back home. The ghost follows her there. She tells her mother after her mother hears her speaking with this spirit in the other room. So the way that we handled it was to make sure that she wasn't depressed, that her grades had not slipped, and to have an honest conversation with Lucy about it. The decision the parents made was to let Lucy have this friend and document uh, conversations, find out what she was being told, and just see what happens. So after about a year and a half, Lucy says to her mom, Uh, My spirit friend is gone, and we find out that in the story, the spirit has lost her parents in a car accident. Well, of course, Lucy had just been divorced, been through a divorce in uh, going through that loss. So is it real? Is it not real? Yes. To To Lucy, it was real. Her conversations were real. If Lucy were three, she'd have had those same conversations. We would have dubbed it play therapy, and we would have called it an imaginary friend. But Lucy's 12. 
So I thought the parents dealt with it well to let it play out and let her have her own form of internal subjective conversation. And that's one thing we can do. Another way to stay connected to our children is to make it part of the daily conversation. Uh, within the book, there's lovely conversations of uh, one woman who is a psychic today, you know, talks with her son every morning at breakfast about dreams. That's their thing. Because in her childhood, she had scary dreams. And so she's just making sure that her son isn't frightened by anything. The Sonia Choquette, a uh, well-known medium, her mother used to set a dinner setting and an empty seat, physically empty, <laughs> at the dinner table every night because they always had a resident ghost in their home. So there's some fun, playful ways that we can do this and just share it as a child's reality and have some fun. You you also point out, I mean, I think the, the challenge for some situations is where parents either don't even believe that there's such a possibility or more difficult is if they think it's the work of the devil. And that is sometimes a young person's experience and why they then shut it down, because not only are they told it's not true, but if it is true, it's the work of, of the evil spirit, so to speak. So address that for a moment, because the cultural conditioning, and I've seen this with so many of the indigenous peoples we've interviewed, and by the way, Sonia was my guest years ago, and she's so lovely, um, that the, the environment in which the child lives and the setting of the parent's own philosophy and worldview obviously has a lot to do with what happens to those who have these innate talents versus those who, through stress, are having a personal experience that is, to some degree, therapeutic and not outside the therapy. Exactly. So let's say in the world of families, we know that the emotional atmosphere of the home fuels a lot of children's fears and uh, just daily stuff that goes on. It might be fear of divorce or just fear of loss. And two-year-olds and four-year-olds and six-year-olds each go through their own different types of fears as their brains grow. So if the worst thing a parent can do is say, you don't see anything, I don't want to talk about it, and you're making it up. Because to the child, it's real. Just because we don't see the stars doesn't mean they're not shining. That child sees something or knows something. Sometimes it's very innocent. So to me, you have a child with a gut-gripping fear. Even had a story a couple months ago about a two-year-old walking to his room down a hallway with his father to bed, looked up and turned pale and started shaking. And he was looking and pointing at the corner, and the father said, there's nothing there. Let's go to bed. So this gut-gripping fear is choking this child. And if somebody says, you're wrong, I don't want to talk about it, you're making it up, that child is still going to bed with a stressed-out gut. And those kinds of turning off emotions or telling, you know, stick it basically, it just doesn't work anymore because we know how much shutting down feelings and stuck feelings leads to illness. So, Boy, I, I just want to interrupt you for a moment because yes. you have so described, and I don't tend to personalize when I do interviews, but you have described my childhood to such a T. I began seeing when I was very young after a near-death experience at three, and I saw something when I was four, which our lovely housekeeper told me was the boogeyman. And everybody told me what I saw I didn't see, but I know I saw it. I slept. I'm a little embarrassed to say, but it's true. I slept with my lights on and my curtains pinned until I was almost 12 years old. And and I'm a psychic today and have been an intuitive and I see things all the time. But it took a long time for my family to adjust to what was happening was happening and I wasn't making it up. I could see. So address that for a moment, because I also have Crohn's disease, which is an adrenal gland illness. And now I'm thinking all these highly sensitive people who are sensitive to sounds and light and crowds and who literally have gut responses to feelings and senses are probably mostly intuitives who have shut down their intuition. 
Well, I do believe there is a correlation between intuitive people and between uh, somatic feelings and illness. Mm -hmm. In the book, Raising Intuitive Children, which was a 2009 release that preceded this particular book, I talk a lot about the environment. I talk a lot about the emotions of the heart and the feelings of the gut brain. And so many intuitive, first of all, people with intuitive intelligence are feelers. That's how they learn. That's how they go through the world. Mm -hmm. Other people hear better. Other people are lookers. But intuitive people are feelers. So if we're sensitive enough to feel um, the magnetic flow of the planet or a uh, car accident up the road or a ghost in the room, there isn't any place to put these feelings, and we do hold them inside. And I have found a correlation. Uh, Part of my therapy in the 90s was working with women who were dealing with illness, chronic fatigue, Mm -hmm fibromyalgia, autoimmune system disorders, Mm -hmm. and many of them were very sensitive people looking for uh, an inner coping mechanism, and they they had it. It's always been there, but it turned out to be their stories, their creativity, all of which are part of the feeling person. You you do such a beautiful job. Look, we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back and talk some more about... um, how we can help the youth in our culture who are coming into this. I mean, Ingo Swan has been our guest over the years, and we've often talked about how there are no schools available for our, our what he calls biomind superpowers, and yet it's the most precious gift, I believe, we've been created with and is an aptitude that is coming to the fore with or without anybody's approval. And so in that sort of harmonious way, let us come back and we'll talk some more about how to help children who see ghosts. Again, our guest, Karen Good, C-A-R-O-N-B Good, G-O-O-D-E. Her book, Kids Who See Ghosts, How to Guide Them Through Fear. Carol, I want to come back to the, the very basics about Children sometimes have different levels of engagement with either an imaginary friend or in seeing ghosts. Some children aren't afraid and others are. And for the parents in the listening audience or the grandparents whose grandchildren might experience this in the middle of the night, what is the best way to help a child who experiences what they see in fear? And then we'll come to the child that experiences this as just part of their life. That's a great question. What do we do for the child who's afraid? Uh, If the child is younger, the first thing that I would like to suggest to parents is that they not barrage the child with questions. Imagine if you were afraid and you were trying to uh, either get away from or hide from the fear. You don't want to stop in the middle and talk about it, right? You want to run. So connection is is how we uh, handle it with our child. touch, uh, helping them feel safe. That two-year-old in the hallway, the dad could have easily picked him up and said, well, you know, uh, let me hold you for a little bit until you stop shaking. Or he could have gently picked him up and turned him the other way and gone to the room. Uh, Children who are older, sometimes they like to draw. Sometimes they like to feel empowered by telling a story about it. So we ask those questions. What are you seeing, and and would you like to tell me about it, and what does it look like? When we have that cognitive function and they're calmed down, you know, getting it out is a whole lot better than holding it in. So even if the parent doesn't believe it's a ghost or that the child is really seeing something, they're still scared. So what's going on inside? And that's just a matter of connection, connection through touch, connection through uh feeling safe with mom or dad, and even taking the child away from the location of where this being is. A lot of the stories I hear, as I'm sure you have heard, are in the child's bedroom at night. So connection, however the, the, the parent intuitively knows to connect with their child, to soothe them, and to help them regulate their fear is one of the greatest gifts they can give them for managing their fears in life. Now, if kids are older and they're afraid and they're shy, I actually suggest parents go so far as to, as to put them in Tai Chi or Karate or Taekwondo, something where they can learn to manage their body and the feeling of Chi in their system, uh, the energy of their body, learning how to use it and how to uh, 
play with it. Because some parents whose, whose children are afraid use play like therapy. Uh, you know, what, two kids wouldn't go upstairs in a new home to the bathroom because there was a ghost up there. Well, Mom went and bought pirate hats, and they got swords, and all three of them charged up to the bathroom together and ended up, you know, laughing on the floor, telling the ghost to get away. Mm-hmm. And it worked. You know, well, the and, and that's an important point. <laughs> it, it, and, it, and I think, you know, um, play is an important part of the work in the spirit realm anyway. But I think this issue of boundary making is necessary to discuss because that's, in a certain sense, helping that child making a boundary, even though it was done through a playful way of dressing up with swords, it's still this experience of that there are boundaries in the spirit world as well as in the physical world. We all know we can close the door to our house to keep us safe. So let's talk about that, of how somebody listening whose child or grandchild or maybe they themselves are going through this involuntarily, how they can go about making a boundary around the experience. Well, there's been a couple of ways that I have helped individuals establish boundaries, but it, there's also a question that has to be asked, and that is, does the person, the adult or child, want a relationship with these spirits? For example, a 12-year-old girl loves to act out Ghost whisper, and she does genuinely see spirits, according to family members and a, a psychic friend of theirs who watches her. But she called me because she wants to take a shower, and she's scared to do so. Mm -hmm. And so I suggested that she painted, uh, you know, like she build a a wall uh, around the door of energy and physically, energetically, with her mind, paint it real or not real. And uh, she came up with her own idea that painting it was too obtrusive to the ghost because they didn't like the colors, and what she saw around them were rainbows. So she painted an energy wall of rainbows to her bathroom door, and it worked. She felt safe. They honored her boundaries. Uh, Someone else who loses a loved one and the loved one keeps coming back uh, needs to say goodbye and set up an energetic door wherever they see it. So they can go. I mean, you had, can I stop you again on another point? Because you tell this beautiful experience of your own during Peruvian travels. (laughs) <laughs> and and I think yeah, it's worth fun. saying, because I know there's skeptics in the audience, as well as those who have had many experiences. And so for them, this is like just a casual conversation at the Hieronymus Breakfast Club. On the other hand, there are others going, I don't believe in any of this stuff. Um, but and, and I think it's important to point out, as you did, that there is a difference between children who have this one or two times in their life and it might be stress related and children for whom this becomes a part of their life into adulthood like yourself or myself and Brad Steiger I love that story you told but tell us your story because I think it really explains some things that not everybody's aware of the story that I I experienced that's in the book is when I went to Peru with a group of adults to uh, work with a shaman down there you know travel etc Anyway, we were in Cusco, and we were staying in a lovely two-story old mansion, old villa. So my girlfriend and I, we traveled together. We took the upstairs room. The room was freezing, couldn't get the heat on. The water was ice cold. And in my exploration, uh, I'm told, well, it's normal. The water's cold. You know, it doesn't get to the second floor. Everybody was telling me everything except my roommate next door, whose shower was next to mine, was getting a full hot shower. So I finally just got this sense that the room was was possessed or taken over or a ghost lived there. There was something going on because the energy was just too cold. So I asked the spirit to show himself. And behind a curtain in the room, those heavy, red, beautiful velvet curtains, uh, stepped what looked like a human friar, old, older, and he spoke Spanish mentally, and I could see the pictures of him being forced to kill the Native people that he encountered with Spanish soldiers, and he had never left the villa. He was scared to move on, and he'd lived there a long time, and then my... uh, 
my roommate, my girlfriend that I was traveling with, she happened to be Colombian, and she got she got the sense of the of the inner language, and I asked her to close her eyes and talk to this thing. She didn't want to, but she did. And uh, she also got the same story. So I asked him if he would please return our hot water and warm up the room if we could uh, open an energetic doorway of light and have him go through and ask for help from whoever he knew on the other side to come meet him and get him. And we did, and he did return the room to warm and gave us back our hot water. But um, the three experiences that I have had of physically encountering ghosts like that in my life have all been with another person, which has led me to uh, give this more credence because of my personal experiences and to honor those who also have them. Well, certainly, you know, the military uses these talents, and there are spy agencies worldwide who cultivate children who particularly are wonderful, whether they're remote viewers or telepaths or telekinesis or, you know, and and we've done many programs on that in terms of military remote viewing and psychic spy warfare. And, And so this stuff is real, even to the skeptics. And I like the fact that you include the skeptical perspective in your book, as well as the perspective that this is real and it's not always about belief, it's about experience. And you you suggest that one of the things maybe that gets in the way of our openness about it is categories of thinking. You said there's automatic, there's institutional, and there's exceptional. And I was just so glad you did this. Can you talk about that a bit for us? I would love to, because Dr. Bob Flower, who lives in Yonkers, uh, put together the scientific work of levels of thinking. And all the levels are good, and all the levels are needed. But if somebody's not aware of their roteness of thinking, they end up putting their kids down and closing doors and losing opportunities for connection and and adventure. So, you know, the the rote thinking is we get up in the morning, we brush our teeth, we schedule our day, we're in time, and that's rote, it's automatic. And now and then if we get disrupted from it, you know, we're, we're grateful or we're upset. It's kind of automatic. The second level is institutional thinking, which is when I was a teacher in school, there's a certain mindset that we hold about children. There's a certain mindset uh, handed down by the funding of the institution. Mm-hmm. If I'm a member of a spiritual group or a church organization, we have certain beliefs. They're community beliefs. And Sometimes that's very helpful for kids, and sometimes it can still limit the way in which you work with your child who may be intuitive and is experiencing something outside of that realm of institutional-type thinking. So exceptional thinking says, would you come to the experience with an openness, with an awareness about what's going on? What's going on? Child turns pale. Child scared. Child says, ghost or spirit or my doggy. So you're dealing with the moment, the child, and the emotional energy of the situation. And that's exceptional thinking, Mm -hmm. being a little more open-minded, looking and observing to see what's going on. What kind of impact? I put it in there. I think it's it helps parents understand where they might be coming from in responding to their child. And it, and what's nice about it is it allows a, a parent or a guardian to see the difference between something that might be the result of um, psychological fear versus a visual perception, and and they can be the same. I mean, combined in the experience, but they per, are precipitated by different things. And I, I was curious what you think about the television shows on ghost hunting in general, and whether it's helping our youth or it's going to have a lot of children faking things rather than really learning? I had this conversation about children faking things with several individuals in that book whom I interviewed. And we all agreed that by the time someone comes to us, you know, as a counselor or a therapist Mm -hmm. or just a friend to talk, these kids don't make things up. Right. They don't know how to make these things up. Um, so I, I don't believe that younger children fake it. I, the, the teens that I have talked to are too sensitive about it 
people want to brag on something that was faked. So I just don't get that in my work. Um, what I have seen is a tremendous influence of the show Ghost Whisper. Mm-hmm. I get uh, young women who email me and ask me if there's a school to be a ghost whisperer because they want to help ghosts. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's uh, triggered that server helper uh, aspect. Well, of it's all a of beautiful it. thing, and in all of the indigenous traditions, there are always people who are the ones that help those cross over. I mean, it's a it's a high position. <laughs> it's it's not yeah. like let's go out and play in the playground. It's it's a really important role that humans play. I think it's one of the things I've always liked so much in Judaism that when a person dies for the 48 hours before they're buried, they are never unattended. And the entire time there are men or women, depending on the situation, reciting psalms for the deceased so that the soul is not alone, meaning there is so much recognition that the soul continues outside the body that the traditions, I think, in many of the world's spiritual paths include guardians to help guide a soul over. We're going to be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Our guest is Karen Good. A wonderful book. Really, I recommend this to everybody who knows children, is guardian of children, works with kids, grandkids, and who might say, I have a playmate. I see Aunt, Aunt Ethel who's long gone or who sees even the future or has really potent dreams about the earth. Our guest, author and counselor Karen Good, her book Kids Who See Ghosts, How to Guide Them Through Fear, a Red Wheel Wiser 2010 release. Remember our website, www.2121stcenturyradio.com, and we have links to all our guests right there. Before the evening is over, can you tell us, Karen, the, the difference you see between children who have guardians some have teachers, some have playmates, some see deceased relatives, and some simply see, see nature, spirits, or other things. Your question was to tell you the difference. Well, in, these in terms of is there a difference in the in is it important to the listener as a parent or as a grandparent? If a child says, "I have a playmate," will that have a different kind of feeling and longevity than somebody who says, "Oh, it's my guardian angel," or "Oh no, it's Uncle Tom." I think a child can see a variety of things, but I believe in, in how the parent responds is certainly going to impact the child's desire to want to continue to see it. I, I In my experience, and I wonder actually if you've had the same experience with uh, guests on your show, is I, I have seen certain children that are specifically attuned to nature spirits and animals. Mm-hmm. And they feel like it's their purpose and connection to uh, caretake the planetary body, Earth, in whatever way they feel they do. Uh, many of them end up working with animals. But to me, that's like a whole level of, of intuitive connection that might be very different than a child who sees inner energies of spirits. So an imaginary playmate, if that playmate seems to be persistent and continues for for years, chances are we've got a good friend there. And if a child says, well, this is really my guardian angel, or this is my spirit guide, or this is my higher self, and I've had children come to parents using those terms without really knowing what they meant. And from the parent's viewpoint, they had to get a lot of information about who this was. Sometimes they called in help to talk to who was talking to their child, but they were usually helpful spirits. They were kind and positive and supportive. And and I think that's child. a really important point because possession is a reality, and, and there's every good reason for people to be mindful that this is true, but in most cases that's not what's happening. However, it does happen. It does happen, and there are, I mean, it's not that every child who has this gift wants it either. I've had children ask me how to turn it off mm-hmm. or how to sleep at night and tell the ghost to go away. They mm-hmm. have no interest in it, and, you know, that's a choice that children can make, and it should be their choice to make it. And in talking with parents, let's say there's a number of parents in the audience who feel that this is something they deal with. You encourage meetups between parents and and their children. Tell us a little bit about how that works. Well, the young woman who I interviewed for that chapter 
had a meetup group in North Carolina. And meetup.com is literally a place where you can post that you're going to meet. It's by geographic city or location. And others who are interested uh, go to meet up. They see what you're doing, and they come. There's no charge. It's like, a you know, fellow interest. Those of you who are interested, come meet with me. So she had a meetup group, and she started one in the Washington State when she moved. And it's been a wonderful way for her to describe the awkwardness of parents in the beginning, Mm -hmm. uh, the children's need, almost dire need, to talk with other children like themselves. And uh, and in person, you know, I've hooked kids up by email and by phone, but they want to talk to them in person and compare experiences and know they're normal. And then once the children... uh, are, are comfortable, you know, and the parents begin to see that these kids talk to each other like, what, what's your English homework, and should we go to a movie Saturday? It's part of their everyday world. There comes to be an acceptance. And when I get emails from parents saying, I don't have any support in my area, what can I do? You know, the question is, form a meetup group. Start your own support group. Step out, you know, for the sake of your kids. Step out. And and what about for the person in the listening audience who says, oh, yeah, you've just described my child, my grandchildren, my nieces. They come to my house. They start telling me about my house being haunted and whatever. What 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 do you recommend to the parent who is more afraid than the child? Because oftentimes the experiencer in all dominions of life is having the experience and the witness, whether it's a parent or another person, can't see or do anything about it. And so they have the fear and their fear is greater than the child's. <laughs> That's true. Sometimes it is. Uh, the parents call for help. Educate yourself. I've never seen a parent who had a great deal of fear uh, that didn't want to know more because they care and, and and want to communicate with their child. They want to know what their child is going through. So the parents that I've met, by the time they find me, they are interested. And so we tell them to read the books. We tell them to talk to other parents, call a local medium or a psychic, if that's what interests them, talk, talk about this kind of phenomena with somebody that they trust, and get information about somebody who has the spiritual knowledge and experience to deal with it. And there are people out there who who do it. There's kind of a network of, of us, us meaning counselors like me, and, you know, maybe I could tell you 10 people around the country who are happy to assist. But the parents need to hold their fear in check because it, it's like an infectious virus, you know. Mm-hmm. It hits the kid, and then the kid's afraid. And then, you know, together they sleep in in one room or, or talk about it as if it were a victim consciousness that they're now growing together, and that's the worst thing that could happen. Uh, the worst, my worst, my worst nightmare is to think of an adult who's still afraid of ghosts. Now, some of that might be cultural, but if it's from just a basic fear of seeing a ghost, and they're still covering their head, you know, when they're 24 and 34 and 44. They need help. They need to talk to somebody. Well, they you you look at our culture. I mean, deal with it. Our, our culture has so ridiculed people who have talked about these phenomena for decades, if not centuries. You could be killed in certain centuries for seeing what you see. So we're talking yep. about something that is innately human, specifically something that the human being has the ability to do. And when our children have these experiences and our culture shuts it down, we interrupt, really, from my vantage point, the development of all of society. And that's why the church or the mosques or whomever, the government in general, has shut this stuff down oftentimes because it makes people completely free. Yes, and you know, with the numbers of children that are having these experiences and the number, I mean, one in every four child has an, an intuitive intelligence that's strong. Just based upon the fact that we learn four to seven ways, there's got to be one person in every four to seven who's got intuition. Now, whether they develop that or not, uh, you know, that's, that's their future. That's their way they interact with the world. Those are the lenses through which they see. And and, and through which, as we 
as we know, sometimes we offer protection. We've talked about that numbers of times on the program of both individuals and ants, (laughs) little ants, the insects who can tell you, you know, days before an earthquake that there's an earthquake and some people get it in their body. I loved before we're finished because we're almost out of time. We have talked about little games that you can do with children to improve their intuition. And you have one with M&Ms. And I just had to close with that. So share the M&M game because there might be people in the audience for whom this will be great for their grandchildren. Well, this was actually a psychic research that was done by Dr. Athena Drews. And it's uh, having M&Ms in a bag or having them on a table, just different colors and having them covered so the child can't see them. But if they're in a bag, then the child might pull one out and hold it and guess the color. So it's more of a color game. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to use them by hiding them under cups and that sort of thing. But basically, you're guessing uh, color with those M&M games. But it's a wonderful way of, of children beginning to learn, or adults. We do these games called What's in a Bag. I do it with adults in workshops all the time, and it's tremendously um, affirming because people begin to learn what their intuitive sensibility feels like when they're not judging, when they're not trying to describe, but just seeing what they get on the inside. And so it's a different exactly. kind of it's sensitivity. Like, ah, aha, exactly. That aha moment. I got it. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Well, it's you you've joy. just done a beautiful job and I think the world is just going to so benefit by your book. And is there anything I haven't brought up you want to touch in our remaining minute? I just want to say to parents, you know, it's all right to not believe uh in ghosts or spirits, but believe your child's experience. Find out what's going on inside of them and Never, ever turn off that connection. It's going to save their lives. That's a beautiful thing to say, and I would share that opinion, having struggled with what it was, as have many people I know and many of our guests. So thank you so much. Our guest has been Karen Good. Her website, www.kidswhoseeghosts.com. Anything else you might need to know, you can find through links at www.21stcenturyradio.com. And don't go away. More coming up on 21st Century Radio. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington, and I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus.